So our cells contain a large number of non-coding RNAs and coding RNAs. In the current annotation of the human genome, we have more than 60,000 genes and more than 200,000 transcripts. And it is believed that in the early days of evolution, the primordial life forms are RNA molecules. And these RNA molecules have the unique ability to carry genetic information and also fold into complex structures interactions. So this is the ability of RNA that make them really powerful in modern life. And here we are focusing on a class of small RNAs called small nucleolar RNAs. And their functions are primarily guiding chemical modifications. So there are two different kinds of modifications, uh, including the 2 prime methylation and the pseudorelation that are catalyzed by these two protein complexes. So these modifications are pretty simple, but their functions are very diverse and very important in modern cells. Right now, our genome contains about 2,000 SNO RNAs, but most of them, we have no idea what their targets are. Only about 20% have been shown to target ribosome RNAs and SNRNAs. So this is one example of an orphan SNO RNA showing the conserved box motifs that are important for forming this structure and also binding the enzymes. But I want to uh, guide your attention to this particular sequence called the guide sequence, which is thought to bind to target RNAs. But again, we don't know the targets, so therefore it's important for us to study this in order to understand their functions. Now, another motivation for studying this important class of SNO RNAs is that they have been linked to various physiological and pathological conditions in genetic studies. So now the critical question in the field has been, what are the targets of these SNO RNAs and how are they linked to these human conditions? The challenge is that cellular RNAs are much more dynamic than heterogeneous. So to study them, we need to develop new methods that can directly capture the in vivo states of the RNA molecules. In order to capture the interactions between SNORI and the real target RNAs, we developed and optimized a set of uh, chemical tools uh, called pairs. So here, the slowly MT served as a cross linker. It will penetrate into the cells and get into the double strand eye, and it will cross link the base pair to eye strand. And uh, after that, the RNA will be fragmented and extracted, followed by proxemic ligation. After reverse cross linking, these two eye parts will be sequenced. And uh, after we analyze the sequence data, we will know which two parts of eye have the interaction each other. So this is the first generation of our method published as a cell. And two years ago, we also optimized the whole process. First, we synthesized a new crosslinker called omotocelin. It will give us more than six-fold in the crosslinker efficiency. So next, we also developed a new extraction method called the total nucleotide extraction method, the TN method. It will give us around seven-fold improvement to extract or purify the cross-linked eye. Third, during the reverse cross linking steps, we know that the salt wavelength will give us the damage, and we find that use single cancer can protect the eye and give us around ten-fold improvement. In the final steps is the reverse transcription steps. We also optimize the conditions and find that the, our new method can give us bypass this damage, give us around 100 fold. So totally combine all the steps, our next generation of a pair's method can achieve more than 4,000 increment and uh, enable us to capture the interactions between slow eye and the real target eyes. Using our new method, we identified around 269 slow eyes can interact with the TIs, and uh, we identified around 954 interactions between SNORI and TIs, and uh, these interactions can include almost all the TIs in the human, human genome. For example, we found that the most abundant interactions is between SNORI-97 and its target tr -masine. So this is the interactions between SNORI and the TIs. However, based on the TI, they are too short and too many modifications on the TIs. So it will be really hard for us to verify them one by one. So what we try is that we use a different method. Here, I show is that the first one, we use the mass spec data to verify it. And uh, we know that the fibrillin is the RBP binding to the CD box neurons. We find that if we knock down the fibrillin, we could find that the mass level on the TRIs will be reduced dramatically. Also, it will affect other modifications on the TRI, for example, M1A, M3C, 
So this means that these two primary methylation will affect other uh, multiplication process. The next uh, method we use to verify is that we also optimize the variable mass sequence data. The denatured method, this means that because the TR is highly structured and it's really hard to capture modification levels. So we denatured the TR first, and uh, we could say that if we knock down the February, which is RBP bending to the CD box 9, also we knock down the two CD box 9, 97 and 133. The data also stresses that if we knock down February and then knock out this snow ice, it will also give us the reduction level and the modification levels and the TIs. So this data uh, can stress that the snow ice can interact with the TIs and uh, modify the TIs to methylation level. So now as we have discovered such a global interaction between snow RNAs and TRNAs, we further zoom in a subnetwork comprising the most abundant interactions between snow RNAs, D971233, and several conserved tRNAs. To further understand the functions of these two snow RNAs, we generated single and double knockout cell lines and perform RNA seq. We view that the loss of these two snow RNAs reduces the target tRNA levels, including tRNA mode our further Robson profiling showed that the loss of these two RNAs reprograms global amino acid usage. For example, the tianemothionine usage was decreased after these two RNAs knocked out, which raises the questions of how these two RNAs affect the transcriptum, and further, how does the cell adapt to the changes due to the loss of these two snow RNAs. A further geoanalysis revealed that the loss of these two snow RNAs induces up a global upregulation of development and differentiation of related genes and their regulation of basic proliferation related genes which make perfect sense because low methionine uh, proteins are correlated with development and differentiation while high methionine proteins correlate with uh, mitochondrial ribosome uh, splicosome functions. So all these consistent results raises the question of whether and how these two snow RNAs regulate development and differentiation. To test this, we used mouse embryonic stem cell and generated single double knockout cell lines of these two snow RNAs and differentiate a mouse stem cell into cardiomyocyte. As shown here, a successfully uh, differentiated cardiomyocyte will beat like this. So to detect the uh, effect of these two snow RNAs on cardiomyocyte differentiation. We count beating cardiomyocytes every three days starting on day nine. The accumulative curves show that the knockout of the 133 overall more efficient cardiomyocyte differentiation than the white time, and the double knockout cell line show even more efficient differentiation. This phenotype was further confirmed by Western blood, QPCR, and rna seq So overall, our results show that the loss of these two snow RNAs uh, promote cardiomyocyte differentiation. In this study, we discovered a large snow RNA target interaction network using the HERS-2 and improved DRMS methods. Putting this model into this classical Washington landscape of development, we propose that the snow RNAs act as master regulators of the tRNA epitranscriptome and also the translation of mRNA into the proteome. And this further has critical functions in guiding the stem cells in traversing this rugged landscape of development. So in addition, we believe that the application of the Paris II methods uh, and the DRMS methods would allow us to dissect the functions of other non-clear RNAs in the human genome.